So thinking forward to your next exam, I recommend planning a day off or more if you can around test time for extra rest and study time before the exam. Next we have chapter 13 and the first part of this is all about blood. So the plasma of your blood is the liquid minus the hematocrit. It's 90% water and also contains food, salts, oxygen, wastes, and proteins. These proteins include things like albumins, globulins, fibrinogen. And the serum then is the plasma minus the clotting factors. Okay, so the majority of your blood um, is going to be plasma, um, but certainly the hematocrits are really important component of this, and we'll talk about that as well. And then when you talk about serum of blood, it's the plasma minus the clotting factors. Okay, so here's what this looks like. When you spin blood down in a tube, you end up with the blood plasma on top, the buffy coat here in the middle, and the buffy coat is the white blood cells and platelets, and the formed elements on the bottom are the red blood cells. When you smear this out onto a slide, you can see the different kinds of cells here. You see red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And so the hematocrit is the red blood cells accumulated at the bottom of the centrifuge tube. So if you want to look at someone's hematocrit level, you would centrifuge your blood sample and then measure the amount of these uh, red blood cells at the bottom. So the formed elements are those erythrocytes or red blood cells, and they have a disc shape. There's no mitochondria and no nucleus. Okay, so if you look at them here, they have this kind of concave shape, like little inner tubes with the space in the middle. But again, no mitochondria, no nucleus, and they don't have these organelles that you can increase the amount of oxygen carrying capacity in there. So red blood cells' main job is to carry oxygen um, using hemoglobin molecules, and having less organelles gives them more space to be able to have more hemoglobin and then more oxygen. A red blood cell's lifespan is about four months. And so they contain hemoglobin, these molecules with iron that are going to bind to oxygen in your bloodstream. So it looks like this. Hemoglobin is actually made up of four different subunits. There's two alpha chains and two beta chains. And each chain has a heme group within it. So you'll see one, two, three, four heme chains within this hemoglobin molecule. Okay. And just to show you what this looks like, um, uh, in a chemical formula, but especially note that this iron in the middle, right? So it's mostly a carbon and nitrogen based molecule, but the iron portion is really, is really important. We start thinking about things like blood health, we think about iron amount uh, in your blood and iron carrying capacity. So sometimes we can have things like iron deficiency disorders that are going to um, result in less effective heme molecules in your hemoglobin. Other formed elements in the blood can, are also uh, white blood cells. These are called leukocytes. And there's multiple different kinds of leukocytes. One type of white blood cell we have are called granular leukocytes. And these include neutrophils, which are the most numerous of our leukocytes, eosinophils that help fight parasites, and basophils that make histamine and heparin. The agranulocytes, the agranular leukocytes, are monocytes that are perform phagocytosis. So they eat up... Um, foreign particles in your blood, and the lymphocytes, the T cells and B cells. And we'll talk about the immune system later on in the semester, so we'll get a little bit more information about the role of um, white blood cells, particularly T cells and B cells and things like fighting infection. But for now, I want you to know the different white blood cells and their general functions. Finally, um, in addition to erythrocytes and leukocytes, we have thrombocytes in our blood, and these are platelets. So those are going to be clotting, um, have a clotting mechanism. Okay. So how you can tell the difference between these things is mostly under a microscope. Our erythrocytes are this red uh, inner tube shaped, right? No nuclei. Platelets are really small, fragmented looking cells. And then the white blood cells, the best way to tell the difference is the granularity, right? So you have the granular ones and the agranular ones, but also the shape of the nuclei. So neutrophils have this three or four lobed nucleus. Eosinophils have a two lobed nucleus. Basophils also have a two lobed nucleus, but it looks more um, like, a, like an H or like lungs almost than the sort of headphones looking at the eosinophils. And the lymphocytes are much smaller than any of the other white blood cells. And their nucleus almost fills the entire cell. Okay. And finally, you have monocytes, the biggest ones that have a big um, single lobe nucleus, 
that fills about half to three quarters of your cell. Okay. So how we make blood cells is from pluripotent stem cells. This process of production of blood cells is called hematopoiesis. And for adults, this is happening in the red bone marrow, primarily in the sternum, the ribs, and the hips. Erythropoiesis is making red blood cells, and this process is monitored by the kidneys. So the kidneys monitor the red blood cells, and if they're low, they release this hormone called erythropoietin. So the hormone erythropoietin, or EPO, is released by the kidneys to tell your bone marrow to make more red blood cells. Um, there are diseases associated with too many red blood cells, one of which is called polycythemia, and there's too many red blood cells. And you might be thinking, okay, well, red blood cells, this is good. We have more oxygen carrying capacity. But at some point, if you have too many red blood cells, this can give you really thick blood and you can end up with things like blood clots um, or an inability to move your blood around your body. So I want to show you this figure because it's uh, not that you need to memorize this, but just to show you that the pathways of these different stem cells. Um, again, you can imagine this is really important in things like biotechnology and immune system function is thinking about how we can create different kinds of immune system cells um, and blood cells from our single multipotential hematopoietic stem cell. So this single stem cell, hematopoietic one, multipotential, meaning it can turn into more than one kind of cell. And um, there's lots of research also into looking at what factors cause it to go down one pathway versus the other. So in our common lymphoid pathway, this multipotential hematopoietic stem cell turns into a common lymphoid progenitor cell. That can differentiate into either what's called a natural killer cell or a small lymphocyte. And then that small lymphocyte can differentiate either into a B lymphocyte or T lymphocyte. And so there's a lot of interest in this area because it it's, turns out that we can maybe um, capitalize on natural killer cells and B cells and T cells to think about things like fight cancer, right? So there's lots of interest here in sort of a, um, immune, immunotherapy um, and immune function for medicine. If this stem cell goes down this common myeloid progenitor pathway, that can then differentiate into something called a megakaryocyte, which eventually will turn into thrombocytes. This can turn into a red blood cell, erythrocyte, a mast cell, or a myoblast. And the myoblast is what gives rise to basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, and monocytes. Okay, so different pathways for this hematopoiesis. In leukopoiesis, that's the process of making white blood cells, um, cytokines are the chemicals that signal stem cells to become white blood cells. Okay, so there are many different kinds specific for the different kinds of white blood cells. Um, in cases where you have too many immature white blood cells, this can lead to leukemia, which can lower immune function. Okay. So to talk about blood typing, we've got four major human blood types, A, B, A, B, and O. And each of our blood types then can also be either positive or negative. So each person is going to have a letter for their blood type and also positive or negative. The antigens are the proteins on the plasma membrane of the cell that determines blood type. Okay, so the antigen is the name of the protein that gives you A, B, A, B, or O blood type. Antibodies are proteins in the blood that bind to foreign antigens. Okay, so typically when you have something like an infection or any kind of foreign um, thing in your blood, your body's going to make antibodies against that protein, okay, against the antigen. Why this matters for the blood type stuff is that when antibodies bind to red blood cells, it can cause clumping, that's called agglutination, and this can be fatal. So this is why we can't do things like we can't just inject um, a different blood type into somebody is because it can cause agglutination, which is clumping, right, and then you can get, again, blood clots. Um, and further this incompatibility reaction that can be lethal. Okay, so the antigens are the proteins on the plasma membrane. The antibodies are in the bloodstream that your immune system makes to target the antigens. Okay, so thinking about the different blood types. A positive has A antigens on their red blood cells. Okay, and they have what's called the RH antigen. So the RH is this positive negative factor here. And so in this person's blood, 
they're going to have anti-B antibodies. Okay, they're not going to have anti-A antibodies because anti-A antibodies mean they attack their own tissues. Okay, but they do have anti-B antibodies. Someone that's AB negative has both A and B antigens, but no RH factor. So the only antibody factor they have present in their blood is an anti-RH antibody. Okay. So this is a helpful graph for me to look at um, the different antigens and antibodies in plasma as well. Okay. Somebody that's O negative is going to have no antigens on the red blood cells. So here you can see A has A type antigens, B has B type, group AB has both A and B antigens, group O has neither, no antigens on the red blood cells. Okay. If that person's O negative, they also have no RH antibodies. Okay. And so we call this person the universal donor. Okay. Oh, somebody's O negative is the universal donor because they have no antigens on the red blood cells. No A, no B, no RH. What this means is when you give their blood to another person, their antibodies aren't going to have anything to recognize. There's no antigens on the group O negative red blood cells. The opposite of that would be the universal receiver. So people that are AB positive can receive any blood type because they have all the antigens already mean that they're not making any antibodies in their blood against A, B, or the RH proteins. Okay. So what can happen sometimes is that antibodies attack antigens normally, right? So in your immune system, you're going to have antibodies attacking antigens, but you don't want to attack your own body. When that happens, when you do inappropriately attack your own body, that's what an autoimmune disorder is. Right? So the antibodies are supposed to recognize foreign things. You shouldn't recognize your own tissues as foreign. But when you do, you can have autoimmune disorders. So again, thinking about an example of this for like B negative, they're going to have B antigens. And so they're going to make anti-A and the anti-RH antibodies. Okay, so if someone is given the wrong blood type, this can trigger an immune reaction. Um, ABO incompatibility, and it can be fatal because again, if you're giving the wrong blood type, that person might make antibodies against the donor blood type, causing agglutination. Okay, so why this positive or negative is called the RH factor is as it was first discovered in a rhesus monkey, and this is just another antigen type on our blood cells, right? So we have the AB antigens, and we also have this this um, RH factor, and you either have it or you don't. So the person has the Rh factor, they're positive, and they can't make Rh antibodies. If they don't have the Rh factor, they say that they're Rh negative, and this person can make Rh antibodies. So it's another thing you have to consider in terms of blood donation is whether that person matches the, the Rh factor. Okay, so again, this graph shows you the um, different groupings, but on here the, the Rh factor is not shown. Remember that each blood type, A, B, A, B, or O, could also be positive or negative. Okay, so when we do this in lab, when we do this in lab, we look for clumping. So to actually determine someone's blood type in a lab, you would do this. Um, and so you can see on this, these plates, there's A, B, and then here's your RH factor. Okay. So if clumping occurs, that means the person has the, has the antigen for that in their, um, in their cells. And you can see here this person's O positive because they don't have any clumping with A or B. But they do have clumping for RH factor, which means that they're positive. Okay. Let's compare that to AB where you see clumping in the A, clumping in the B, and clumping in the positive. So that means that they have AB positive blood. Somebody with B-type blood is not going to clump with A, but they are going to clump with B and with the positive, and so on and so forth. You can look at this too, um, and this might be something that we could eventually do to determine your blood type in lab. Okay, so let's think a little bit more about this blood transfusion stuff. If someone's blood type A negative, they have A antigens on their red blood cells, they can make anti-B and anti-RH antibodies. So the types of blood they can safely receive are A negative or O negative but they can donate to A negative or A positive because they don't have any antigens 
on for um for the positive negative and the um a positive person isn't going to be making anti rh antigens if somebody's ab positive they don't make any blood antibodies so they can safely receive any blood type but they have all the antigens they have a they have b and they have the rh factor so they can only donate to ab positive we said O negative was our universal donor because they have no surface antigens. They can make all the antibodies. So they can only receive other O negative blood, but they can give O negative blood to any other blood type. So they're universal donor. This is not actually the most common blood type in the country, though. Um, in the U.S., the most common blood type is O positive. But again, that's going to depend on the country that you're looking at. Okay, so when somebody, when you give somebody a blood transfusion, you're typically giving packed red blood cells, okay? And you're doing this so you can eliminate all other parts of the blood. If you give the wrong type of blood, their immune system will respond to the foreign antigen and attack the blood, which can be lethal. So, little quiz question, what blood type can a person with O positive receive? And what blood types can somebody's AB negative give to? So I said that in the U.S., O positive is the most um, common blood type. You see that we have a pretty um, O positive and then A positive is close behind. Um, but again, this is in the U.S. and so it's going to differ by country. Okay. okay. Thinking a little more about this RH factor, where this comes up a lot is in pregnancies, particularly if the mother is RH negative. Okay, so if mom's positive... And then it doesn't matter because she is already has the antigens for the RH factor. And so she's not going to make antibodies. If the R mother is RH negative, however, she's going to make antibodies against the RH factor. Okay. So if her first baby is RH positive, she's going to make antibodies to that RH positive factor at birth. Okay. So this baby's going to be totally fine because um, they're already born when this, this interaction happens. If the second baby, though, is Rh negative, no problems because the baby's negative. And so there's no antigens on the baby for the mother's antibodies to attack. If another baby, though, is Rh positive, the mother's antibodies then that are in the blood already from our first baby here will cross the placenta during pregnancy and attack the baby's red blood cells because it's recognizing the positive antigen on the baby's red blood cells. And this can result in a condition called erythroblastosis fetalis. So it's very dangerous for the baby. Um, but there are ways to prevent this from happening. So um, there is a, a shot called a Rogam shot um, that prevents the mother from making antibodies at birth. And so if somebody's R, the baby's R, mother's Rh negative, um, some hospitals will give that shot regardless. Some will look at the... Um, the factors from the mother and father and determine whether it's possible for the baby to be RH positive before they make that decision to give the shot. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about platelets. Um, platelet, platelet aggregation um, is prevented in intact endothelium because blood is separated from collagen. Okay, so here we've got normal blood, inactive platelets. Um, the collagen is here, okay, and it's not. Um, in contact with these platelets. Okay. Other things that are involved in this pathway of platelet aggregation is going to be nitric oxide and prostaglandin, so two hormones. And NO is actually going to be a gaseous hormone. And both of these compounds are platelet aggregation inhibitors. Okay, And they're released by this endothelial layer. So when there's damage to the tissue, the collagen is exposed and the platelets start to stick. And now, when they stick, they secrete ADP and something called thromboxane to recruit more platelets to form a platelet plug. So they're attaching to the collagen and they're plugging up this hole that's made in the tissue. Fibrinogen in the plasma will convert to fibrin and adhere to plug to form a clot. This makes it really stable, right? So your clots are pretty stable um, and you can eventually end up with like a scab, right? So now before we start talking about heart and cardiovascular system, we're going to talk a little bit about um, hemostasis. 
And so we need to think about a couple factors here. One is vasoconstriction of vessels, platelet plug formation. Oh. And those are all the steps that we just mentioned before, okay? And then the formation of fibrin. In the formation of fibrin, there's two pathways, an intrinsic and an extrinsic pathway. Both pathways lead to a prothrombin being converted to thrombin by something called factor X. And factor X requires vitamin K. Factor X is often called factor 10. Okay, so factor 10 requires vitamin K. So we need essentially vitamin K then for clotting. Thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin, and fibrin is stabilized with factor 13. Okay. Hemophiliacs, people that can't control bleeding, are missing that factor 13. So that means that they don't clot as easily and they can do things like have major blood loss issues. Okay, um, okay so once all this process happens, you have a blood clot. A floating clot is called an embolus. A clot in a healthy vessel is called a thrombus. So emboluses are scary, right? You think about a pulmonary embolism, which is going to be a clot in the lungs that causes damage there too. Clots in healthy vessels are really important. These are thrombuses, okay? And there are certain categories of drugs, coumadin and warfarin, that block vitamin K to lower clotting. In people that have clotting issues, it becomes really important in order to thin their blood, right? In other people, they have a problem clotting, and so you need to go the opposite direction. Um, if you've ever worked in or had children or worked in OBGYN, you might know that at birth, um, it's, it's regulation to give babies a vitamin K shot. And this is to prevent uh, issues with clotting, right? So vitamin K is required for clotting. And if a baby doesn't have appropriate vitamin K in their body and they have a bleed, it can, it can be a really big problem and very dangerous for them. So sort of standard in U.S. hospitals is to give vitamin K shots at birth. Um, so that any clotting issues can be prevented. Okay, so here's these pathways just in a visual format. Okay. Um, here's the extrinsic pathway, and here's that intrinsic pathway that both um, work towards this common pathway of eventually that active 10 factor, prothrombin to thrombin conversion, activating fibrinogen to fibrin conversion, ultimately creating that fibrin polymer. Okay. The extrinsic clotting pathway is initiated by the release of tissue factors. The intrinsic one is initiated by the activation of that factor 12 by contact with collagen or glass. Okay. And the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways converge when they activate that factor 10, eventually leading to that formation of fibrin. And finally, I want to talk about um, some of the other blood vessel issues we're going to come across, things like atherosclerosis. So here in atherosclerosis, um, you know, normally you have blood traveling in this vessel here. It's the lumen or the space of the vessel. And surrounding that, then you have an endothelial lining surrounded by smooth muscle there too. When fat and cholesterol crystals accumulate um, under that endothelial layer, then you can have atherosclerosis where you have, you see this is pushing into that blood vessel lining, right? Additionally, you can have ulcerations, so literally holes in that endothelial lining um, that can cause a couple things to happen. Fat from these atherosclerotic um, areas can, can leak into blood vessels. You can have loss of blood from the lumen, and so we're just creating a very dangerous situation here. Okay, so last thing to do, for you is to review your anatomy, right? Review your anatomy's arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins. Uh, veins are distensible and low pressure. They're typically larger and floppier than arteries are going to be. And I want you to remember some of these diseases. So arterial sclerosis, where you have a hardening of the arteries, and this can lead to stroke and heart disease. Atherosclerosis is the plaques, and this is the most common type of arterial sclerosis. Remember that the valves are one way, and so you have these um, uh, valves on the veins to prevent backflow, okay? So when blood is pushing through, going to the heart, it pushes the valve open. And remember, this is done by these muscle, skeletal muscle contractions. So the muscles can contract and push blood, opening these valves. It goes up there too, and then when the valve closes, blood cannot flow back because the, the valve is closed. 
Okay. So I want you to review all this part on your own. Okay. Review the different um, anatomy and types of vessels we have. Review the connections between the vessels and the heart. So then when we move into the heart and heart physiology and cardiac physiology next time, you'll be prepared. Okay. So before we move on to the second part of this lecture, please review all this anatomy. All right. I'll see you next time.